So I would wager that almost everybody watching this has heard rumblings or comments passing by about the Roland TR-808 drum machine. Even if you aren't a producer or generally a big fan of music, this one product could quite possibly be one of the most famous pieces of tech in the music industry. It not only found its way into numerous hit songs like Marvin Gaye's Sexual Healing, but it also changed both the sonic imprint of songs all around the world after its existence and how people think of music production itself. There are a few different reasons why this product entered the Music Hall of Fame which we'll go through later in this video, but first we need to understand the environment in which it was created in along with how it got made in the first place. If you don't already know what the device itself is, it's complicated and simple at the same time. A drum machine at its most basic is an electronic instrument that plays or creates percussion sounds. Previous to the 1980s, most analog hardware based music production tools came with preset rhythms and samples from which you could use to create songs with. The tools were barely limited, and while they were impressive for their time, they did present a problem for producers. You can't really create your own sounds or unique drum patterns very easily. However, this would all change when Roland released the TR-808 drum machine in 1980. Let's take a look at what the world of music production used to look like before this product, along with the man who created it. The selection of musical devices during the 60s and 70s were most certainly not to be discounted, but their capabilities were still constrained by the technology of the time period. Most drum machines were created to accompany organs in the home and did not allow self-programmable patterns or rhythms which meant the user was relegated to whatever preset options came with the machine. A lot of music at the time was a product of this technology limitation with drum patterns of the era matching that of the machines that produced them. During this time period, both funk and disco were dominant as a reaction to the rock music of the time, and you can see the influence these devices had on these genres among others. However, these limitations didn't stop producers from getting the most out of their drum machines. I think one of the more ingenious ways people found to squeeze a little bit more use out of their drum machines was to slow down or speed up these preset patterns that came with them. This sort of created the perception of change when really there wasn't much going on. This let engineers and producers use these earlier drum machines in a variety of genres that they may not have been intended for. A lot of drum machines like the Seberg 601B were multi-purpose, having large rows of buttons with different labels like jazz, waltz, or tango, and each contained a popular drum rhythm for the genre of choice. Like mentioned before, one of the biggest limitations of these machines was the fact that not only were the patterns preset, but you couldn't change the sounds baked into the patterns to get a different feel by using an alternate sample with the same rhythm. However, things did get more clever over time before Roland shocked the world with the TR-808. For example, the Elka Drummer 1 had volume knobs for each instrument within the patterns, letting you control the presence of individual samples which gave producers a lot more to work with when using these type of machines. You could even fully remove a sound or multiple sounds from a loop, resulting in an almost completely different sounding drum pattern. Developments like this were happening left and right as more companies outside Japan were starting to develop their own take on the drum machine. As the years went on, music technology continued to get better and better, resulting in some pretty remarkable innovations. Products like the Lin 9000 introduced pressure sensitive pads, letting you change the velocity of drum hits with the touch of a finger. This device also came at the perfect time, as by 1984, MIDI had been widely adopted by the industry, allowing the device to double as a digital sequencer and recorder with an impressive 7000 note capacity. Looking back at some of these older machines, it's extraordinary how much could be done with such simple devices. Of course, they were most certainly not simple for their time, but considering the tools we have now at our disposal in the modern day, they were quite novel in comparison. Now that we've briefly covered the decades leading up to the TR-808's creation, let's take a closer look at the man behind it and his journey to founding the Roland Corporation. Ikutaru Kakahashi was born in Osaka, Japan in 1930. He would be the man who would later go on to design the famous TR-808, but he got his start with engineering and hardware much earlier than that. 
he spent a lot of time at the Hitachi shipyard studying electrical engineering, but sadly his home was destroyed by bombings during World War II, and he ended up relocating to the southern island of Kyushu. When he was 16, he started repairing various items like watches and clocks at a wash repair shop, furthering his knowledge and interest in creating and repairing technology. He would later go on to learn to repair radios and gained a newfound interest in music-related devices. During his college years, he returned to Osaka to attend university and later found a passion for music and went on a search for a way to create an electronic musical instrument in 1958. He had no formal musical training, so his motive for being in the music industry was to make it more accessible for professionals and amateurs alike. A year later, he constructed his first monophonic organ, and this one instrument would be a major inspiration for Roland in the years to come because of its accessibility, size, and affordability. Some years passed while he gained more experience founding a company of his own called Ace Electronic Industries and applying for several patents in the process. However, the story we're focused on starts in 1972 with Ikataru's founding of Roland Corporation. The company started with seven employees who previously worked with Ikataru using $100,000 and a rented shed as their workspace. Roland was a unique company in the space because its competitors were highly concentrated on appealing to professionals while Roland based most of its products on the aforementioned monophonic organ trying to make their products for hobbyists. Roland had a profound impact on the music industry and would go on to release several iconic pieces of hardware like the TR-77 and CR-78 drum machine. A lot of devices at the time, including products from Roland, were instrumental in the emergence of many different genres of music including hip-hop, Detroit techno, or acid house. None of them would end up reaching the insane heights that the TR-88 would end up climbing to though. However, things didn't exactly start out well for the newly minted drum machine. Upon its release, the TR-88 received mixed reviews and was heavily criticized for its unnatural sounding drums and by all accounts was a complete commercial failure. It was so bad in fact that after constructing only 12,000 units, Roland quickly discontinued the device which was succeeded by the TR-909 a couple years later. One of the reasons for its failure was an unfortunate mistake when Roland bought faulty transistors which resulted in the emulation of the sounds it generated not being as realistic as they'd liked. This mistake would ironically be one of its most defining characteristics, giving its sounds a warm sizzling effect and would become beloved by the music industry in the future. I think this one mistake may have eventually saved this product from becoming a relic of a time gone by, as in the modern day, analog based devices are generally favored because of the type of warm sound that can't quite exactly be replicated digitally. Even though it was swept under the rug at the time, I think its feature set was still fantastic for the era. Most drum machines in the 70s and 80s were still loaded with pre-recorded samples and loops that would be played back through the device. However, the 808 was different in this regard because it was one of the few devices that generated sound with analog synthesis. This allowed producers to create a vast amount of different sounds with varied characteristics which ended up being its saving grace later on. Some examples of sounds the TR-808 is capable of generating are claps, cowbells, snares, and most importantly, a deep sounding bass drum. Like mentioned above, the sounds didn't exactly replicate their real life counterparts and were described as clicky and robotic. Fact Magazine from the UK even likened them to bursts coming from the BBC Radiophonic Workshop rather than a real drum kit. But I think that's what made it special and eventually stood out amongst an expansive sea of other machines. An individual using it could create their own rhythms with 32 patterns being played at once and each of the sounds could be fine-tuned to their liking. These different aspects of the TR-808 would eventually be picked up by some producers and it started gaining steam in the coming years, sort of like a cult classic movie revived from the depths of cinema hell. The impact and legacy of the 808 is pretty damn remarkable. It had its hands in many Billboard 100 songs, influenced entire genres, and brought up many kids from that era to go on to become some of the best producers in music history. For starters, one of the earliest hit songs recorded with the Roland 808 was Marvin Gaye's Shockful Healing. He said that he was drawn to the device because it let him produce music without the help of other musicians or producers. 
This song was released in 1982, about a year before the device would be discontinued, but this one, amongst a few others, was enough to give the device a new life and would later go on to define an entire generation of music. Another name associated with the 808 that you might have heard of is Rick Rubin. Nowadays, he's considered one of the most influential record producers of all time, but back then he was tinkering away with the Roland 808 in his NYU dorm room. Rick's influence on music can be traced back to the 808 machine, as he is widely credited for popularizing hip-hop records, producing for acts like Run DMC, Public Enemy, and LL Cool J. Hip-hop itself was largely spawned through the use of deep bass drums available on the Roland 808. Hank Shockley of the Bomb Squad production group was even quoted as saying it's not hip-hop without that sound. While the Roland 808 is capable of generating a wide array of different sounds, none are as important as that bass drum. The term 808 was even coined because of the influence that sound had and is now generally used to refer to the punchy sub bass within trap and hip hop music. Kanye West even based an entire track list off of this one sound with his 2008 album 808s and Heartbreak which became a definitive hip hop album solidifying the place that the Roland 808 had in hip hop culture. 808s and Heartbreak is widely considered to be a turning point for the sound, spawning a wave of producers creating beats that would define the 2010s. Albums like Evol by Future, as well as Goodbye and Good Riddance by Juice World, can be seen with a long list of tracks using different flavors of 808s as their bass lines. The Roland 808 made its way into many other genres as well, including pop and electronic music, and it's a staple for music producers everywhere, whether you're in a $2 million studio or just have a MacBook in your bedroom. It even spawned many copycats and successors, one of which included a digital replication of the original created by Roland in the form of a VS. VST. If you aren't too familiar with VSTs, I'll leave a link in the description to a video on my channel about them. But to give a brief description, a VST or virtual studio technology is a platform created by Steinberg for developers of sound plugins to use that plugs into most modern music workstations. A side effect of its release was that it afforded companies who had created analog or hardware based instruments the opportunity to digitally emulate them as a VST for a new audience to use and experiment with for far far cheaper. Of course, there is heated debate over whether or not digital emulations truly represent the characteristics of analog sound. Many people swear by analog devices, saying that they have some sort of magical warm quality to them. And who am I really to argue? I mean, after all, the Roland 808 was quite literally defined by its components not working as intended, resulting in a distinctive sound generated from the analog medium. All of this is to say, the Roland 808 trends transcended its physical form as a drum machine and completely changed the music landscape during its era and afterward. Reading about this device was some of the most fun I've ever had researching and writing a script for these videos. If you enjoyed, please don't hesitate to recommend other topics or maybe some underground hardware or software that you like that you think needs a voice. Thank you guys for watching, stay safe out there, and I'll see you in the next video.